got to be connecting to, who you ought to be calling, who you ought to be speaking to, because we are in the time of harvest. So I want to encourage you with that word this morning, that you will spend that time with the Lord and give Him that time because He wants to connect to you in a personal way. He wants to download to you, to your life. He wants to speak those things. So let's arise in the season and bring forth the harvest into the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. I'll hand the time over to Dr. Chris. Good morning once again. Now I want to just continue uh, from where I left out uh, uh, two weeks back when I spoke to you all. And I was speaking to you all about the Lord's Prayer. And uh, I want you all to just turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verse 11 to 13. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11 to 13. Now, this is part of the Lord's Prayer, the second part. It says there in verse 11, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, I want to just zoom in immediately into verse 11, where Jesus says to pray this way, where he says, give us this day our daily bread. Now, you must understand something about bread. Bread was uh, or bread represents or shows us the basic necessities of life bread is the symbol of all that is necessary for survival because that was the staple food in that country at that particular time right it was necessary for survival it was necessary for a filled life a fulfilled life and there is much meaning in this simple request, give us today our daily bread. Uh, before I go there, I also want you to note something. Remember, Jesus didn't say, give us today our bread for the next 10 years. He said, give us today our daily bread. Right? Now, I want to speak about bread. Right? Now, the, if you look at the phrase, give us our bread. The words our there and us, give us our bread. That means we overcome selfishness. That means we show concern for others. Any person who goes to bed hungry should be a, of great concern to you and I as believers of Jesus Christ. And then obviously the second uh, phrase of words or set of words that I want to concentrate on is this day. This eliminates worry. This eliminates anxiety about tomorrow and the distant future. Right? And as I said earlier, it helps us, it teaches us and helps us to trust God day by day. The just shall live by faith. Day by day. Then it goes, he goes on to say, our daily bread. Remember, every believer has a portion of daily bread, which is his. I have my portion of my daily bread, which is mine. Pastor Maria has got her portion of her daily bread, which is hers. You have got your daily bread according to the portion that is supposed to be yours. Right? And, 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 and we do not ask for someone else's bread, but we ask for our daily bread. We ask for our own. We seek and we work for our own bread. We do not steal or eat from another man's table. Amen? Amen. Give us bread. That means we ask for these necessities, not the desserts of the world. You know when you go for a meal, we all want to have desserts. But we ask for bread. 
the main meal. Give us bread. We as believers, we confess our inadequacy and our dependency upon our Father in heaven. We are dependent upon God even for the basics of life. Give us this day our daily bread. This teaches the believer, this teaches you and I to come to God daily in prayer and to trust him daily to meet our needs. The first point I want to make is this. Give us today our daily bread. If you look at the entire series that I've been teaching you on the Lord's Prayer, this is the third request that's to be prayed. Remember Jesus started in verse 9 and he said that we should pray after this manner. That means we pray something like this. Father, give us our bread this day. Give us our spiritual as well as our physical bread. Feed our souls. Feed our bodies. Make this a glorious day in you. And God, the world is starving for you. And many are starving from hunger. Feed, Lord, feed your sheep. In Jesus' name. That's a sample of prayer. That's how we pray to the Father. Not give me, give me, give me. Right? The second point I want to make is God cares for man and his welfare. I want to tell you this. There are 7.5 billion people today. And God loves all the 7.5 billion people. God loves you. If nobody has said that they love you today, I want to tell you today, God loves you. Amen. Right? So God cares for us. He cares for our welfare. Right? You know, uh, why do I say this? He cares for us and he cares for our welfare. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, verse 31 to 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 to 33. That's your scripture reference. I'll read it to you. It says that, therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. He cares for man's mental and emotional well-being. God cares for your mental and emotional well-being. 1 Peter 5 verse 10. It says, But the God of all grace, who had called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, Established, strengthened, settled you. God cares for man's spiritual being. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, Paul says this, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Dwell, uh, 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 sorry, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You are the temple of God. We are the temples of God. The third point is this. God cares for the human body. And several things show this. Remember Jesus said, ask for the necessities in life daily. Every day, ask for your necessities. Number two, he sent his only son into the world in a human body. He didn't come here as a, as a robot. He didn't come here as a, uh, as fire or as flood. He came as one of us. He raised up Christ in his body, a resurrected body, a glorified body. And he promises to give a new resurrected body to us, the believers. We as believers will dwell in the resurrected body, this glorified body, forever and ever. No more sickness, no more diseases, no more viruses. 
He has chosen our body, the body of the believer. He has chosen our body to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. The fourth point is this. The simple request is a great lesson for both the rich and the poor. The rich man feels self-sufficient as though what he possesses came from his own hands. Therefore, he always thinks, who is the Lord? The poor man has nothing. And often this poor man is forced to steal. Thus, he raises his fist in anger and curses God for his state of life. But in Proverbs 30, verse 8 to 9, the word of God says this. Now he that planted and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. Mm. So what I'm trying to say here is that we as believers, we, must, we are to trust God for the necessities of life. We are to praise God for what we receive. We have learned in whatsoever state, you know, we, we have to learn this thing. In whatsoever state I am, there it to be content. I am satisfied with what I have because I've got Jesus Christ with me. Amen. Now, verse 12. Verse 12 says, I'm, I'm going to Matthew chapter 6 again. Huh? Verse 12, the Lord's Prayer. And forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. I want to talk about this word debts. The word debts means dues, duties. It means something which is owed. It means something that which is legally due. Now, in relation to sin, it means a failure to pay one's debt. One's dues. A failure to do one's duty. A failure to keep one's responsibilities. God has given man certain responsibilities. Certain things to do and certain things not to do. Every man has failed at some point to do what he should do. And certainly no man would ever claim he has fulfilled his duty perfectly without any failure, without any shortcoming. Sin is universal and everyone fails in his duty at some point to some degree. Everyone needs to pray, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. The prayer is actually asking God to do three things. Firstly, you're asking God to forgive the debt of sin. That means we have failed God in, his, in our duty. Therefore, we need God to forgive our debt. Secondly, we ask God to forgive the debt of guilt or punishment. One who has failed to pay his debt is guilty. Therefore, he is to pay the consequences. He is to be punished. This is the reason we must pray, Father, forgive my debt. Thirdly, we must ask God to forgive our debt just as we have forgiven our debtors. This is asking God to forgive us exactly as how we forgive others. That means if one forgives, God forgives. If one does not forgive, God does not forgive. Therefore, any person who holds anything against another person is not forgiven his sins, no matter what he may think or has been told by another person. The next point I want to make, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. This is the fourth request to be prayed. The believers should pray after this manner. Now, this is how we pray. 
Father, forgive me. Lord, have mercy. I'm the sinner. I'm the nothing. But God, you are my all in all because you are the all in all. Have mercy on me. Father, forgive others, all others, Lord. I hold nothing within me against anyone. If there's anything within my heart against anyone, help me to forgive, Lord, in Jesus' name. That's how we pray. Don't simply recite the Lord's Prayer as a recital. As a reputation. I want you to note this morning, my friends, in seeking forgiveness, we have a duty to both God and man. We have a duty to both God and man. Firstly, our duty to God is to ask for forgiveness when we fail to do His will. Remember 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. Our duty to men on the other hand, is to forgive his sins against us. Right? In Mark, in Mark chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said, And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. So if we wish to be forgiven ourselves, both duties have to be performed. We must forgive those who sin against us, and we must ask forgiveness for our sins. Thirdly, there are those who do, much, who do us much evil. You know, in this world, many say and do all manner of evil against us. Bad news and evil purposes run wild. And it is not always outside the church, nor outside the family. Sometimes, Terrible evil is committed by word and by act, both within the church and within a person's family. Christ says, we must not react, we must not be harsh towards those who sin severely against us. But we must forgive. We must forgive if we wish to be forgiven. There are basically four things that we as believers must do when sin against. Number one, we must understand that it's always a reason why a person sins against us. Too often we forget this. For example, a person may be mistreated by someone who is close to him. He may be withdrawn from, he may be neglected, he might be ignored. Therefore, he may, may, may react against a believer. And the reaction may range from self-pity to bitterness to hostility. Then you might have a person who may be tired, who may be aggravated, who may be worried. Therefore, he may become too direct or he might be too cutting or, or too harsh towards the believer. Then again, you might have a person who may be of a shy nature, who may have a sense of inferiority, Therefore, he may act unfriendly. He may be unconcerned, unconcerned towards the believer. Then again, you might have a person who may have, uh, 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 who may have rumor and gossip and wild imaginations shared with him. Especially by a person who has been hurt. He may be lied to and misinformed. Therefore, he may act suspicious and have nothing to do with the believer. Then we have also this kind of, uh, 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 you can also have a person who may have a great need, a great need for attention and for emotional support. Therefore, the person may imagine, exaggerate, blame, or accuse a believer in order to rally support of friends and to gain the attention needed. And what must we do? We as believers, we must forbear. We as believers, we must forgive. We as believers, we must forget. That means, when I say forget, means that means we don't harbor the wrong done to us. There are four lessons that we need to note from this. 
four lessons. Number one, an unforgiven, an unforgiving spirit causes pain and hurt and tragedy, both to oneself and to others. It can ruin lives, especially the lives of those closest and dearest to oneself. Secondly, we can curse ourselves by praying the Lord's Prayer. We are in trouble when praying the Lord's Prayer if we are angry and do not forgive those who sin against us. Remember, Father, forgive us as we forgive our debtors. We pronounce the very same judgment upon ourselves that we hold for others. Thirdly, forgiveness is conditional. The reason is simply explained. We have sinned against God and others have sinned against us. So if we want God to forgive us, we must forgive those who have sinned against us. How can we expect God to forgive us if we do not forgive those who have sinned against us? We can expect no better treatment than we give. And fourthly, forgiving others is evidence that God has forgiven our sins. Forgiving others is evident that God has forgiven our sins. Verse 13 of Matthew chapter 6. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to talk about this term temptation and deliverance. Now, I want you to understand something. Every time people pray this part of the Lord's Prayer, they say that the Lord leads them to temptation. I want to tell you this. God does not lead a man to sin. He tempts no man. Right? He tempts no man. Uh, if you want scripture reference, James chapter 1 verse 13. You can go back and check on it. James chapter 1 verse 13. What is Christ saying here? Is two things. Number one, he says, pray. Pray that God will keep you from the awful pull of temptation. That means we as believers, we have, we have to have a sense of our personal weakness against temptation. If you are an alcoholic and if you were an alcoholic and you have been delivered from that, you have overcome that situation, how do, what is going to tempt us? Sitting in a pub or a club. You can be drinking water, but the temptation will be so great, eventually you're going to fall. So we avoid that situation. We avoid going to such places, right? So we have to have a sense of our personal weakness against temptation. And we got to pray that God will keep us from that awful pull of temptation. Secondly, we got to pray. We got to pray that God will deliver us from evil. The Greek word here says, from the evil one. The evil one is Satan. The request here is for God to rescue, God to preserve and to guard us. Remember, the evil one is so deceptive and powerful. He's as powerful as a roaring lion. Roaring lion. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says that. So the, the, the plea and cry is for God to deliver, right? For God to deliver us, number one, from temptation, and number two, from the evil one. So your prayer and my prayer should be something like this. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is the fifth request that is to be prayed. That means we should pray after this manner. Father, lead us not into temptation. Lord, temptation comes so often. It, its pull is so strong. We get in the way so much. We seek our own way. And we, we react at every turn. Oh God, do not leave us to ourselves. Father, deliver us from the evil one. He is the master of deceit. And paint such a beautiful picture. If you leave us to ourselves, we will fall. God, 
The evil one is capable of being a roaring lion, seeking to devour us. Father, deliver us. Father, rescue us. Father, preserve us. Father, guard us in Jesus' name. Amen. That's a sample of the prayer. Not give me, give me, give me. My name is Jimmy. And you won't get anything because your name is not Jimmy. Once we have been forgiven our sins, we must ask God to keep us from sinning again. You know, if you, if you ask God to forgive your sins, and once you know that your sins have been forgiven, we must ask God to keep us from sinning again. And two things are important to keep us from sin. Firstly, is deliverance from temptation. And secondly, is deliverance from the evil one. And this request is a necessity for you and me, you and I as believers of Jesus Christ. And there are two reasons for this. Firstly, all believers are tempted. And believers are tempted often. And normally when you and I are tempted, we are not tempted by strange things. But we are tempted by things that are common to all. Temptations do come and will come to all. The same temptations. The second reason is no believer stands above falling. In, in, in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. The apostle Paul says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Temptation we have to pray against temptation. And temptation is to be prayed against for two reasons again. The first reason is because sin causes God great hurt and pain. And secondly, because sin causes great trouble. Sin causes guilt. Sin causes grief for both oneself and the other. We must pray. We must pray also for God, for the help to overcome the evil one. You know, the evil one attacks, and he attacks by deception. Two ways he attacks, by deception and by direct assault, seeking to devour. So in dealing with the evil one, we as believers, we need to remember two things. Every time you think that you are dealing with the evil one, yeah, we are dealing with the evil one because we are at war. But when we deal with the evil one, you need to remember two things. Firstly, you and I got to remember that greater is he that's in me than the one that's in the world. 1 John 4, 4. Greater is the one that is in you that it is, that is in the world. And secondly, you need to remember if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Romans 8.31 If God be for us, who can be against us? I want to go on. Matthew 6.13, the second part of Matthew 6 verse 13. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the part where praise and commitment comes back. Is repeated again in this prayer. Praise and commitment. These words are not in the best or oldest manuscripts of the Greek. Many scholars believe, uh, this is what we call, or, or traditionally we call, uh, if you go to the mainline churches, you, they call this the doxology. Doxology, right? And many scholars believe the doxology was added at a later date. To be used in public worship. However, there's a similar doxology. Let me spell it for you. D-O-X-O-L-O-G-Y. Doxology. Even David, King David, in 1 Chronicles 29-11, uh, he recited this doxology. Right? The point of the doxology is to stress everything belongs to God. Right? Everything belongs to God. Number one. He is the source of the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. He is the source. Secondly, he is the possessor of the kingdom, the power and the glory. 
And thirdly, he is the recipient of the kingdom and the power and the glory. And we as believers, we belong to the kingdom and the power and the glory of God. Amen. That is why I keep on telling all of you, you are not a defeated foe. We belong to the kingdom. That's right. If you are going to have a poor servant mentality, you are going to remain servants. We are kingdom people. Just like the, uh, 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 you know, just like the uh, royalties. We are royalty. We are a royal priesthood. Amen. I want you to understand this morning, and I want to remind all of you who are watching even on Facebook, that you and I as believers, we belong to God's kingdom. You must remember that God accepted us into the kingdom of God, and God has promised to transfer us into the kingdom of its glory, either at death or at the Lord's return. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the believer belongs to God's power. We belong to God's power. God has delivered us from sin and from death and continue to deliver us every day, every hour, every minute. Amen. Thirdly, we belong to the, God, to the glory of God. We belong to God's glory. God has done all for us as believers that in ages to come, God might show the exceeding riches of his grace. God may show the exceeding riches of his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the third major point to pray. And how do we pray? Father, yours is the kingdom. You have the right to rule and reign. Father, yours is the power. The only power that can really rule and govern. Father, yours is the glory. Oh God, all glory belongs to you. That's how we pray. Not I, me, and myself. I, me, and myself. I want you to note three significant points. Firstly, thine is the kingdom, says two things to us. Thine is the kingdom, says two things to us. That means the right to rule and reign throughout the universe is God's right. It belongs to no one else. The only government that possesses utopia, that means the very best of all, that very government that lasts forever, is God's government. The second thing it says when it says, Thine is the kingdom, is that the right to rule and reign is God's. No one else has got that right. Only God's government can bring love, joy, peace, and the very best of life. You know, in Acts chapter 17, verse 24 to 25. Acts chapter 17, verse 24 to 25. It says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, Neither is worship with man's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. So that's the first point. Thine is the kingdom. Second is thine is the power. Thine is the power says two things. Firstly, God alone has the power to create. God alone has the power to sustain perfect government. He alone has the power to support and bring perfect government to man and his earth. He alone has the power to change man so that they can escape death and live forever within a perfect government. He alone has the power to steer man to live in love, to live in joy, to live in peace and to serve completely and unselfishly so that all may have the very best. And thirdly, thine is the glory. Thine is the glory says that God alone deserves all the honor. God alone deserves all the praise. God alone deserves all the glory. 
He is all in all. Amen. Amen. The one subject that is to dominate prayer is praising God. The fact that the Lord's prayer begins with praise and ends with praise shows this. Now I want you to remember something. God does not praise. Remember, he has got praise of multitudes of angels. But he deserves our praise. God created us with the ability to praise him. So he must want our praise. So a genuine believer is always praising God's name before all. And, and I, before I close, there's one more word. One more word that is very important. Some say it out of religiosity. Amen, 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 amen. But nothing, meaning nothing and doing nothing. Amen. The word amen. Right? Basically it means so be it. Or it means it is and it shall be so. Right? So be it. Or it is and it shall be so. Now when, when the word amen is spoken by God. When God, when it's spoken, when the word is spoken by God. Amen means it is and shall be so. Unequally. When spoken by men, it is a petition meaning. That means let it be. Mm -hmm. Let me repeat that. When it's spoken by God, amen means it is and it shall be so. When it's spoken by men, it means let it be. So here in the, in the Lord's Prayer, the word amen is a word of commitment. So when you and I pray the Lord's Prayer and we close it by saying amen, that means we are saying let it be, that means we are committing ourselves to do our part for the things which have been prayed. Amen. That's why the Lord's Prayer is not a two-minute prayer. You can take hours praying the Lord's Prayer. Amen. 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 I pray this morning, as the, as the Word of God has gone forth and as the Holy Spirit ministers to you, that you and I will be able to reposition ourselves as sons and we will be able to praise and worship and glorify the Lord in the right manner. Amen. According to His pattern, which Amen. is kingdom pattern. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. God bless you all. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 All right. I just got two announcements to make. You know, uh, uh, I want to appeal each one of you. You know, when we are in church, when we meet physically face to face, there is always uh, uh, an offering time. Now, offering is part of our worship. Right? Some of us are very happy when we meet online because we don't have to give offering. But you know, technology, as we meet like this online, God also provides technology in the banking sector. We have got online banking. <laughs> right? So if you have been touched and if the Holy Spirit is, is, is uh, 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 asking you to sow a seed, please contact us and we will give you the bank account details. Everything goes into the ministry account. Right? Because, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of, of, of internet scam that's going around today. We don't want to simply promote and put our account numbers everywhere. That's right. Right? Let's use wisdom. <laughs> right? Let's use wisdom. Right? So, uh, uh, the Facebook, you can switch off.